So it's very difficult to estimate uncertainties in a bias-free way. Now, estimating bias and assessing uncertainty is something that we physicists are usually not very good at. And this is because we are typically used to thinking that, after all, our task is to calculate, to measure as precisely as possible by following a well-defined procedure where there's little room for bias or subjectivity. So I thought that maybe in order to get some kind of insight on the nature of the problem and possibly also some inspiration of possible ways to tackle it, it might be interesting to turn to the humanities where it is completely impossible to access the full set of original data, well, this could be an interesting exercise. And therefore, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, I asked my friend Lucas Henning, uh, who's a musician, to illustrate uh, uh, this point. So I will pass the word to Lucas for a few minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so the term I'd like to take as the point of departure uh, for my contribution to Stefano's presentation is bias. Uh, I was invited to provide a musician's perspective on the issue and for the purpose of demonstrating uh, how bias affects musical performance, I am going to play a short piece for you three times over, each in a different way. The first time you will hear it now is in the form of a um, group exercise, if you will, in fostering bias. So should the following evoke any of the prejudice usually associated with this instrument, uh, the lute, please do hold on to it for later. taken note for note from a book by a certain Vincenzo Galilei, who was the father of Galileo Galilei and, as some of you may know, a lutenist and music scholar. And he introduces this piece as one of several playful experiments with a novel conception of modal theory that Galilei's teacher, Giuseppe Salino, had developed some years prior. So what this tells us is that this music was in fact not conceived under some medieval balcony in the hands of a jester for some Disney princess, but much rather uh, in a humanist study. For a music historian's past days to ends, this bit of context alone is enough to immediately rule out this first performance just heard in regards to its authenticity, which is musicology's guiding principle to gather whatever factual information is available, to contextualize the score and then rule out any modern bias or prejudice that might distort our image of the composer's intent. What troubles this academical approach is how it conflates the score with the music, which, like all performative art, has a continuous time element. So a score is bound to only ever present a trace or a fragmentary set of traces, actually, of an event which has already transpired. When we try to reconstruct that event of performance, from the score, we inevitably are faced with gaps and uncertainties. Uh, for example, Galilei's piece simply does not indicate how fast or slow it should be played, but in a moment of performance, not one uncertainty of this kind can be left unresolved. How do you even play a piece without a tempo? Maybe this is something for a physicist to figure out, but not for a musician. And this is only one of countless gaps we have to deal with before we can uh, even hear what's written there. So what I'd like to attempt now is uh, Galilei's piece from a, um, let's say, musicologist's angle, as literal and fact-based as possible without adding anything of my own unless absolutely necessary.
So the result, of course, ends up being somewhat of a farce again. One could argue whether this really beats the first performance in coming reasonably close to Galilei's intent as a composer. The dilemma here lies between committing to bias on the one side or to uncertainty on the other. My first performance took a musically self-sufficient but biased concept of how music for the lute sounds and confronted it with the set of traces that is Galilei's score. Whereas my second performance tried to avoid distorting the factual information as best it could by leaving uncertainties unresolved altogether as fast as possible. Uh, both produce a result that is not just incomplete, but in fact misleading in regards to our conception of this music, uh, this instrument of Vincenzo Galilei as a composer or the Renaissance period altogether. So my proposal as a musician is to approach this dilemma we are facing in a paradoxical way, recreating a past event by explicitly avoiding to reenact it. What makes the reenactment approach so misleading is that the object observed is the result of some form of momentary inspiration. The work of a great musician uh, originated from a unique musical impulse, an artistic process that took place in the moment of performance, while the reenactor must suppress their own musical facilities in order not to distort their view on the original, which in turn already disqualifies their reenactment in resembling that original work uh, in a capacity that's relevant. So ultimately, um, the artist's way of observing a past performance must be to create a new one of their own while confronting it with the information at hand. That new uh, performances self-sufficiency and expressive potency are what enable it to, by artistic means, generate the insight that a non-artistic reenactment or attempt of lesser artistic merit are doomed to overlook and filling the gaps uh, misrepresent even. So the, the way my final, this time honest rendition of Galilei's piece is presented to you is not as my reenactment of his playing, but uh, as my own music informed by his score and by the context surrounding it. are the Scylla and Charybdis uh, between which we also have to navigate, where one uh, possibility uh, is to simply give way to bias, but then this produces results which have uh, uh, little to tell us, uh, you know, they have uh, little to do with truth, as, as I tried to argue in the first part of my talk. The opposite alternative, which is equally unpalatable, would be simply to abandon any attempt at getting uh, to some underlying truth or physical law, which is equally useless. So what we should try to do instead is actually, using Lucas's word, uh, recreate the underlying reality or truth. Now, for us physicists, this would mean determine the underlying physical law, which is producing the phenomenon we are trying to observe. Now, of course, at this point you would say, well, you know, if you were so clever that you could solve non-perturbative QCD and calculate PDS from first principles, you, you would have been famous. Uh, indeed. On the other hand, uh, these days, in several years, we have tools whereby one can try to infer an underlying physical law even without directly knowing what the physical law is. And this is where artificial intelligence and then machine learning come in, because uh, the recent tools of machine learning are doing for us precisely that, namely trying to form an intuitive picture of the underlying truth without actually being able to write down the equation. 